So, sorry to put a downer on the whole evening, but uh, that, uh, that is very much the truth about China as well. Uh, and it's the interaction between the hope and despair, uh, the tension between those two things, which is very much the tension of modern China, uh, and uh, which I think in understanding that, hopefully it can go some way uh, towards our understanding of where China is going to go. So, it's people like this that I spoke to all along the road, but the journey, of course, begins in Shanghai. And if you have not been to Shanghai, I strongly advise you to book a ticket next week and get on the plane and go immediately, uh, because it will blow your mind. It is the most extraordinary city on the planet at the moment, I think. Uh, think of Manhattan in about 1900, and you get something of the picture of what Shanghai is about. Uh, and this is where everyone wants to get to. Uh, this is the Bund along the waterfront with, of course, the Communist Party flag still flying overhead. The Industrial Revolution is going on in China as people make their way all the way along to factories like this. They're making your clothes and mine. They're making your children's toys and my children's toys. They're making everything that we have in our houses. But in in the West, we had 150 years for the dust of the Industrial Revolution to settle uh, before we launched into our other great revolution, the Technological Revolution in China. They're happening simultaneously with about 100 times as many people. So all of this is creating a huge dislocation in China, which is one of the main causes of what is going on there, the psychological, of course, the physical dislocation, 200 million people on the roads, traveling to factories like this. Um, it's creating a dislocation, I think, mentally as well, psychologically, spiritually, uh, in all sorts of ways. Everything has changed. In many ways, the cities are similar to Western cities. We're a few decades back, maybe a century back in some parts, but there are a lot of similarities, and you can do uh, almost anything that you would do in a Western city go to visit all the brand stores, or even some of the brand restaurants. Um, yes, indeed, Hooters Shanghai is open for business, and uh, you can go there, and uh, it's a, they've turned it into a remarkably sort of child-friendly family atmosphere, actually. I was extraordinarily sheepish to walk in there, obviously in the interests of research. I, I needed to go in, but I, I was sort of checking that nobody was watching and then it was full of children and they turned it into a sort of family dining atmosphere but um, uh, there it is and uh, everything has changed in China um, the the fact that it has changed of course as I said spiritually psychologically means uh, a lot of people are wondering what this is all about what life is all about uh, they're searching, they don't believe in communism anymore. That's just the typical church in China, completely full to the brim. They have about four services, all of them full, uh, throughout the day on Sunday. Bible studies, evening services, you name it. Everyone is, or many people, are looking for what this is all about and trying to make sense of it, uh, of the confusion of being in a communist party state that endorses full capitalist policies. If you're not confused by modern China, I often say, then you simply haven't been paying attention. And here's Route 312, uh, out, just out of Shanghai. It's not the main freeway anymore, as you can tell in this picture. It, it's usually a bit busier than that. Uh, but the network of roads that has taken, uh, been built across China is really joining the country together. Uh, my road, 312, uh, has had a lot of the traffic taken off it by uh, the freeways. Uh, there's a freeway just about a half a mile to the west here, to the left here. But I traveled on the slow road mainly because it meant I could stop and talk to the villagers. The government wants you to travel on the fast road, so you see all the shiny surface of things. It's only when you dig down underneath a little bit that you find out what's really going on. And as the megalopolis of Shanghai recedes, what's going on is this. And this picture could pretty much have been taken at any time um, in the last couple of centuries. Things here have not changed much at all, and this is one of the big uh, contradictions, the very big fault lines. It's possibly the biggest fault line uh, that runs through modern China now, and that's the, the wealth gap between the cities and the rural areas. 
Um, there, there, of course, are a couple of hundred million new middle class people in the cities. It is very real, the development. It's not some Potemkin village. Shanghai is real. All the other cities are completely real. But that just leaves about 800 million people, two and a half times the population of the United States in the countryside, who are not necessarily partaking of this boom. And what's happened now is that since 1989, the roles have been reversed. In 89, it was the intellectuals in the cities who were angry. The peasants didn't take part because they were still on the up. That has now been turned around, and the urban people have, by and large, been uh, bought off, to use a rather loaded phrase, by prosperity, and the peasants are now angry. And if I were uh, the Communist Party leaders, I know which I would be more concerned about. In 2005, there were 87,000 incidents, according to government figures, Chinese government figures, uh, incidents of rural unrest. But there is a difference now. If you don't like the countryside, you can literally get on your bike and get out of there. And this is one of the things that is transforming China. You can hit the road. And millions, tens of millions, and a couple of hundred million people are doing that. They are making choices. They are going to do what they want. It's not perfect. It's not, uh, it's not freedom in the Western sense as we would know it. But compared to the past, it is amazingly free. The birdcage of Chinese life, as it was, has become an aviary. It doesn't mean that you're free to fly up into the clear blue sky. And they can still catch you if they want to. But uh, there is a lot of space to move around. You can go and work as a hostess in a karaoke bar. Uh, you can choose who you marry. Just driving along the road. This is a rural wedding just about to happen. And there's her dowry on the back and, uh, and the floral display on the brand new uh, Volkswagen car. Um, a lot of choice now in China, which is really transforming the country. Here, this is a further down the road. These guys. Uh, their parents were cross, crisscrossing the country, smashing the place up in the Cultural Revolution. They've just got out of school and they decided to bicycle across the Gobi Desert for fun. Uh, so people are doing things that they want to, and this is affecting China hugely as people find out more about social and economic freedoms, if not political ones. It's not great for everyone. These three men have contracted HIV as a, a result of a government blood selling scheme. Uh, and I had to sneak into their village in the back of a covered van. Um, they are basically being left to die by the government because they, they're causing too many problems. Uh, and the government is uh, very annoyed with them for getting the word out to Western reporters uh, about the government's complicity in their contracting of HIV. So there are a lot of places along the way. You go from one day to the next. The hope of the people in the new jobs, the despair of the people here in the AIDS villages of southern Hernan. Then you emerge onto another little island. This is Xi'an, the wall, the ancient wall of the ancient capital of Xi'an. You can see it there about a third of the way across. This is where the terracotta soldiers are, uh, who uh, are a fantastic symbol of Chinese uh, imperial culture. And here is Huashan, the ancient Taoist uh, mountain that uh, is one of the five old holy mountains. And I climbed up. I didn't get to the top, actually, because I didn't have time. And I was looking for sources of Chinese spirituality. And I kept asking everyone as we were climbing up, um, so, so do you know what Taoism is? It used to be spelled Taoism. Um, Taoism, and they were going, most of them were sort of, uh, not sure, it's something about nature, isn't it? And a lot of people just simply didn't really know uh, about the details of what Taoism was, until I found a hermit who had actually shut himself away in this cave at the back here, and uh, he knew exactly what Taoism was, because he'd retreated from the world and was trying to live as a Taoist hermit. And I thought this was rather impressive, and uh, it took me a long time to find him and struggle up the path. And I thought, I said, well, I'd love to come back and, uh, uh, and, and see you sometime, because I had to push on. And I said, well, so can I just show up and come stay in your cave for a while and just sort of monk out for a while? And, um, and he said, yeah, and he said, yeah, that'd be, uh, he said, that'd be fine. Or you can just call my cell phone. Uh, <laughs> just a, a classic. A classic China moment, he wrote his cell phone number down. Um, 